I now can sing since I've been redeemed I'm on the everlasting, everlasting rock I faith in Christ my Redeemer King I'm on the everlasting, everlasting rock Then roll, roll, billows roll I'm on the everlasting rock of ages Roll, roll, billows roll I'm on the everlasting rock. Welcome to the Voice of Hope. We're a Bible teaching program that's a clear message in the noise of life. I don't know whether you're well versed in the Bible or just turning its pages for the first time, but we're here with you learning to follow Jesus, our King and Messiah. The Voice of Hope is brought to you by Heralds of Hope, an international media ministry focused on using media to teach the Bible and to make disciples of Jesus. The Voice of Hope is not the only program that we produce. Heralds of Hope currently produces Bible teaching in 26 languages, in addition to English. We title these programs Hope for Today. A number of these programs are sponsored by churches, businesses, or even individuals. However, the rest are not. Each summer, several generous partners offer to do a double match for each donation received to support these unsponsored broadcasts. This year, our goal is $80,000, and then with the double match, that will bring the total to $240,000. This amount will cover our unsponsored international broadcasts for 2024. Many of you have already given, and for that, I want to say a big thank you. But if not, would you be willing to partner with us to cover this expense? If so, stay tuned until the end of the program, and I will give you our address where you can send your gift. For this week's episode, we're going to take a small detour into the Gospel of Luke and look at what it means to seek the kingdom of God. I'm joined here today with our Bible teacher, J. Mark Horst. So let's listen as he teaches us from Luke Chapter 12, verses 22 to 34. Many of us in our childhood had exposure to what we called fairy tales, the world of make-believe. And often those stories would begin with this phrase, once upon a time. Once upon a time, there was a king who had all that the world could afford. But the thing that he loved the most was to laugh. And one time while he was being entertained, a jester came along and he wanted to join in the festival and perform for the king. So he was given the opportunity, and he put on the best comical show he'd ever done, and the king said he laughed harder than he had ever laughed before. Once the festival was over, the king wanted to hire this man to be his personal court jester. After he was hired, the king laughingly handed him a small stick, and he said, You are the most foolish man alive. When you find someone more foolish than you, give them this stick. And then the king laughed heartily at his own wit. Many years passed, and the king lay dying on his bed. He called for his jester, because he wanted to laugh one more time before he died. When the jester was finished with his performance, he asked to speak to the king alone. And when they were alone, the jester said, King, where are you going? And the king responded, On a far journey. The jester asked, And how do you plan to get there? The king said, I don't know. At those words, the jester pulled the stick from one of his pockets and handed it to the king. As you might imagine, the king was stunned, and he asked the jester why he had given him the stick. And here is what the jester said. King, today I have found a man more foolish than I. For you see, I only trifled with the things of life, but you have trifled with the things of eternity. That king was much like the rich fool Jesus spoke about in Luke chapter 12. He had accomplished a lot of great things. He had accumulated all kinds of wealth. But he wasn't prepared to die. In Luke chapter 12 and verses 13 to 21, we learn about the dangers of covetousness. Covetousness damages relationships. It distorts reality. 
and it also determines rewards. It's important for us to remember this, because the first verse of our text for today begins with the word, therefore. We'll see the significance of that more clearly as we examine the text. I've titled today's teaching, Seeking the Kingdom of God. Right now, I will read Luke chapter 12, beginning with verse 22, and read through verse 34, and then show you the rewards of obeying Christ's commands that are related to seeking the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you so anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet, I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have, and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches, nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The commands Jesus gives in this text present several rewards that come to those who are truly seeking the kingdom of God. The first reward for seeking the kingdom of God is it reduces anxiety. In the parable of the rich fool, just prior to our text, the wealthy farmer gave a lot of thought and attention to his newly discovered wealth. He wasn't just concerned about what he needed for the day, but what he thought he needed for the rest of his life. And so he planned accordingly. But Jesus called him a fool because he planned for a future he would never see, and he failed to plan for a future he couldn't escape. Like the king in my opening illustration, he trifled with the things of eternity. He learned the truth of Ecclesiastes 5.11. When goods increase, they increase who eat them, and what advantage has their owner but to see them with their eyes? But he forgot the truth of Psalm 62.10. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. And then Proverbs 23.5. For riches suddenly sprout wings, flying like an eagle toward heaven. Jesus ended that earlier section of teaching by warning the crowd that this is the condition of every person who lays up treasure for himself, but is not rich toward God. So the foolishness of the rich farmer is the backdrop for Jesus' teaching about the kingdom. You see, the rich farmer made a terrible mistake, one from which he did not recover. He had expended all his energy on his present circumstances, that is, his physical life, and he ended up with nothing to show for it. After he gave this example to the multitude, Jesus now turns specifically to the twelve. In light of the grave error that was made by the rich farmer, Jesus counsels the twelve not to be anxious, distracted, or worried about their physical needs. And the grammar indicates that this command can take on the positive, do not be anxious, or the negative, stop being anxious. Some people have taken the wording of the King James Version, take no thought, as a reckless disregard for the future. But you know, that's not how the original readers would have understood it. Shakespeare and other writers of the time when the King James Version was written clearly used this word with the meaning of anxiety. Jesus used the same word in Luke chapter 10 and verse 41 in his rebuke of Martha. He said to her, Martha, Martha, 
you are careful or anxious and troubled about many things. Jesus told her she had allowed herself to be distracted by things that were of lesser importance. In verses 22 to 28 of our text, Jesus speaks primarily about our need for food and clothing. His first statement in verse 23 sets the tone for what follows. He said, Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. One might be hard-pressed to reach that conclusion in our modern, consumer-oriented culture. Huge amounts of time, energy, and finances are expended on these two things. Far more than what our needs require. Albert Barnes asked this question. Shall not he who has conferred the greatest blessing, life, be willing to confer the less, food and clothing? Now, along with acknowledging our needs, Jesus issues several commands. The first is, consider the ravens. What can we learn from them? First of all, to consider is more than just giving something a passing glance. The word speaks of observation and understanding. Jesus said, the ravens don't store up provisions in a pantry or a barn, and yet God makes sure they always have something to eat. But neither do they sit on a tree branch and wait for their food to come to them. Jesus reminds the disciples they are of much more value than the ravens. Earlier in this chapter, Jesus mentioned his father's care for the sparrows, how he notices when just one of them falls to the ground. When you take time to observe and understand what Jesus is saying and the comparison he's making, then our anxieties about our needs seem somewhat irrational, don't they? And a renewed focus on seeking God's kingdom will reduce our level of anxiety. In verse 24, Jesus continues this theme by asking another question. Which of you, by anxious worry, can add even an hour to your length of life? Now, I know the KJV says can add to his stature or his height, one cubit. But the Greek word used here can refer to either height or length of time. And Jesus is talking about food and clothing, which relate to sustaining or prolonging life. And so I believe verse 26 helps us clarify the meaning. Because there, Jesus asks this, If you are not able to do what is least, or very small, why do you worry about bigger things? Now, to me, adding 18 inches to your height is not a very small thing. That would be a major accomplishment. But how about adding an hour to a lifetime of 70 years? That's not such a big deal, right? So here again, the Word of God is its own best commentary. The context helps us understand the meaning. The second command Jesus gives that will help to reduce anxiety is, Consider the wildflowers of the field. No one plants them, they don't work, and they don't weave cloth. Yet not even Solomon, in all his extravagant royal finery, was dressed in such exquisite beauty. Seeking God's kingdom reduces the level of anxiety in our lives about our material needs. It gives us a greater ability to appreciate the beauty that God has placed all around us. Not only that, Think for a moment about the lifespan of a wildflower. Even though it lasts a very short time in comparison to a human life, yet God creates it with great care and beauty. Will he not much more care for you and me as his children? And the grass of the field grows at God's command without cultivation. It exists today, and then in that day it was cut down on the morrow and used for fuel in the oven. If God invests time and energy in something as simple as the grass of the field, how much more will he care for you and for me? How weak and small our faith often is. In light of God's care for the lower orders of his creation, the command of verse 23 takes on greater clarity. Do not be anxious or worried about your life, what you will eat, nor for your body, what you will wear. I acknowledge that we live in a world filled with uncertainty. Governments and economies teeter on the brink of collapse. Violence abounds, and injustice seems to increase everywhere. And yet we don't need to be afraid. God has promised to supply our needs as we seek his kingdom. And when we follow his commands, the reward is reduced 
anxiety, and increased faith. The second reward, then, in seeking the kingdom of God is it reorients activity. In verses 29 to 32, the commands of Jesus reveal this second reward. Notice again, he begins with an imperative. And you do not seek, or stop seeking, what you are to eat and what you are to drink. Jesus' use of the word you is emphatic here. You yourself stop seeking. From the context, we understand that the seeking Jesus is talking about is more than just looking for something, because the word contains the idea of striving to secure or obtain something. He further says that we are not to be anxious for our daily necessities. We mustn't attempt to buoy up our minds with false hope. By false hope, I mean the idea that if I can just earn a little bit more, if I can just store up a little bit more, then I'll be secure. Remember, that's what the rich farmer thought, and we know how that worked out for him. According to verse 30, anxiety for daily necessities is what preoccupies the peoples of the world. Again, I quote Albert Barnes, Those destitute of the true doctrines of religion and unacquainted with proper dependence on divine providence make it their chief anxiety to seek food and clothing. You know, many people see this life as the sum of human existence, and so we understand why they would strive for these things. But for you and me, who know what true life is, why do we struggle so much, especially when we have so many promises from God that He will supply our needs? Jesus shows us clearly that seeking the kingdom of God will reorient our activity. We turn from striving after the supply of our daily needs and turn to striving for his kingdom. I want you to think with me about this idea of reorientation. The people of the world have their minds oriented to the present and to the near future. They focus on their lifetime. And because their focus is on gaining maximum pleasure in life, they make similar choices to those of the rich farmer. You probably know friends or neighbors or even family members who have made generous provision for this life but failed to make any provision for eternity. That's because their lives are oriented or directed by the desires of their human existence. So when a person becomes a disciple of Jesus, his mind, will, and emotions need to be reoriented. The focus of life shifts from seeking the world's material goods to seeking the spiritual realities of the kingdom of God. Remember, Jesus is speaking to the twelve when he says, Stop worrying about what you are going to eat and drink. He was challenging them to reorient their lives to a new paradigm. And that same challenge exists for you and me today. One question that immediately comes to my mind is, How do we do this? How do we become reoriented to the reality of the kingdom of God? Well, think about a compass. It's a very simple instrument used to determine direction. A compass is basically a magnetized needle that reacts to the magnetic field that surrounds our Earth. But the Earth's magnetic field is weak. So if you inadvertently place a stronger magnet near the compass, the compass will give you a false directional reading. That is, the compass will reorient itself to that stronger magnetic field. When God created you and me in his likeness and image, we were born with an orientation toward him. But because we are born with a sin nature, there is a competing orientation. As children grow and develop, the orientation toward sin and self becomes stronger, and if it's left unchecked, it becomes predominant. And all of us who have children or grandchildren know how this works. If a person is not exposed to the truth of the gospel, or if they reject it, they continue following that orientation towards self. Their needs, their wants, their desires become the controlling force in their lives. Their internal compass deceives them because the magnetic pull of self is stronger than their orientation toward God. They may even think they're headed in the right direction, but in reality, they're headed for destruction. Then in contrast, a follower of Jesus is oriented toward the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? 
Well, if you want a fuller explanation of it, I can send you a printed or audio copy of my teaching from Luke chapter 4, verses 32 to 44. It's titled, Preaching the Kingdom of God. So what does it mean to be oriented toward the kingdom of God? Let me share with you a response from a radio listener in India who reoriented his life toward the kingdom of God. He is now a regular listener to our Hindi language broadcasts. Here's what he said. For the last eight or nine months, I went to another state in search of a job. In this period of time, I could not listen to your radio program or any Christian programming. My prayer life became disturbed due to my busy timetable of work. I had no time to spend a few minutes with the Lord. I have seen that there was no blessing in all my earning. I spent more than I earned. All of these things caused me to think about my spiritual life, and one day I decided to come back to my village and restart my farming business in my father's field. Today, here in my house, I feel peace because I have been continually listening to your program for three weeks. The Lord has restored my spiritual strength through His Holy Spirit. Your messages and prayers bring many spiritual blessings into my life. Sometimes Satan attacks me, but I believe that through your prayers he will be defeated. Please pray for me so that I may completely commit my life into the hands of the Lord. Can you see how this brother has reoriented his life toward the kingdom of God? His original thought was he could make more money if he moved to another state. But then he discovered, like many of us have, that the more you make, the more you spend. And tragically, it was detrimental to his spiritual life. But by reorienting his life toward the kingdom of God, he is now experiencing peace and spiritual blessing. That's marvelous. The Savior has come in his mighty power and spoken peace to my soul. And all of my life from that very hour I yielded to his control. I yielded to his control. Oh, it is wonderful, it is marvelous and wonderful. But Jesus has come for the soul of all the heart has never been full. Oh, never been told it is wonderful, it is wonderful, it is marvelous and wonderful. Wonderful, what Jesus has done for the soul of all the heart has never been told. Never been told. From glory to glory he leads me on, from grace to grace every day. And brighter and brighter the glory dawns while pressing my homeward way. Thank you, J. Mark, for that timely message from the book of Luke. I think if there's one word that summarizes this current generation, it's anxiety. I've been reading a book about Generation Z, and the writer points out that anxiety is one of the main characteristics of this generation of young people. 
You know, thankfully, the real answer to this is found in Jesus. It's through him that we can find rest and peace. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to the second part of this episode. So return next week as we look into that. If you would like to listen to this program again, please visit our website at heraldsofhope.org and look for the title, Seeking the Kingdom of God. If you have any thoughts or comments, please contact us. Our email address is hope at heraldsofhope.org. Again, that's hope at heraldsofhope.org. I invite you to connect with us on our various social media platforms, including Spotify and YouTube, by searching for Heralds of Hope. To contact the Voice of Hope, specifically to send us a gift for our summer double match, please note that when you send it to the Voice of Hope, 6183 Lincoln Highway, Harrisonville, Pennsylvania, 17228 or you can visit our website at heraldsofhope.org and you can make a donation right there on our site. If you would like to give us a call, our phone number is 866-960-0292. Your prayers are needful and your gifts are always welcome. God's grace, accompanied by your fervent prayers and generous financial support, will enable us to work together to win the world for Jesus. Be sure to join us the next time for The Voice of Hope as J. Mark concludes his teaching on seeking the kingdom of God. Under his wings I am safely abiding Though the night deepens and tempests are wild Still I can trust him, I know he will keep me He has redeemed me, and I am his child. Under his wings, under his wings, Who from his love can sever? Under his wings my soul shall abide, Safely abide forever. Under his wings, what a refuge in sorrow, how the heart yearningly turns to his rest. Often when earth has no balm for my healing, there I find comfort and there I am blessed. Under his wings, under his wings, Who from his love can sever? Under his wings my soul shall abide, Safely abide forever. Under his wings, oh what precious enjoyment, There will I hide till life's trials are o'er. Sheltered, protected, no evil can harm me. Resting in Jesus, I'm safe evermore. Under his wings, under his wings, who from his love can sever. Under his